Hello and welcome to the fifth webinar in 12D's Industry Solutions webinar series. My name is Lisa Stewart and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator at 12D Solutions. While we wait for everyone to finish joining, I'll just pop up a polling question. You'll have about 30 seconds to answer about whether meeting your client's BIM requirements poses a challenge for you and then I'll show the results. Okay, a variety of answers here. Those of us who aren't sure are going to get a lot out of today's presentation, I think. Okay, so let's get started. Our industry solutions webinars are designed to provide insights into overcoming challenges in an evolving industry in more effective and efficient ways. We'll keep running these regularly and recording them for posting on our website and on YouTube. Our first four webinars are already available online if you missed those. During this live presentation, you'll be able to type your questions along the way, as shown on the screen. And we'll answer as many as possible throughout this webinar. At the end, I'll also read out some of the questions to the presenter for his insights. Today's webinar, BIM Overview, will be presented by Tony Ingold, who has worked in Australia, the United Kingdom and the Middle East in highway design, project management, construction supervision and contract management. For the past 15 years, he has headed up Extra Dimension Solutions, the New South Wales ACT and South Australia distributor for 12D Model and 12D Synergy. Today, Tony will be showing examples of road design using 3D TriMesh, the use of attributes in road design and some of the collaboration tools available. Over to you, Tony. Thank you very much, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, uh, any, any presentation about BIM uh, is not complete without a BIM definition, and uh, mine will be no, no different. I think there's actually been a constitutional amendment that says you must do this uh, here in Australia. If you want a formal definition of what BIM is, you can go to the web. web. There, there's no shortage of formal definitions there. The definition I'm going to give you this afternoon is based on my experience talking to my clients, uh, which in turn implies the requests that they have had. So it's, it's a BIM that civil engineers, civil designers need to provide to their clients. And the first thing here is modeling the civil design using 3D solids. 3D solids because increasingly we have our stakeholders with a, a non-technical background. The definition I'm going to give you is based on my experience dealing with requests from my clients, which in turn implies the requests that they have had from their clients. So it's, it's a BIM definition for uh, an engineering design situation. And firstly, it's modeling the design using 3D solids. 3D solids because increasingly we have stakeholders with a non-technical background. Uh, project managers, community consultation, uh, fa facility managers, marketing people, people who are not able to read engineering drawings. And 3D, modeling the 3D solids gives them an opportunity, an opportunity to understand the design, makes the design accessible to them. Implicit in modeling with 3D solids is the ability to inspect the design and to, to report on the 3D solids in some sort of 3D viewer. It may seem a, a, a trivial statement to make, but it, I think it needs to be stated that having the ability for the whole team, for all of the stakeholders to look at the design is imperative in a, in a BIM situation. The real money, though, is in metadata. Uh, building information is all about the information and, and storing information on the 3D solids. Now, Torby has been doing this for a long time. We, re we refer to it as, as attributes. But it gives the ability for the users to pick, the, pick an object on the screen. You can access the data that's related to that object uh, by some sort of mouse click or by some sort of reporting. Typical data that's stored on the, on the entity, you might have the installation date of a stormwater system. You might have the manufacturer's part number for the grate on a stormwater pit. You might have the length of pipe between stormwater pits, which could feed out to a bill of quantities. Uh, these are only a few that, that come immediately to mind. I think that as we see more and more collaboration across design teams and more and more collaboration between designers and builders, um, we'll see more and more use of, of metadata. Um, for instance, as I, I, know one, I know of one design and construct contract where the designers are passing electronic data to the contractor for construction. The revision status of the design is included as an attribute in the data. So the, the site surveyor can, can click on the screen, uh, he can do a right mouse click and he can find that attribute and find out the revision that he's looking at, that he's about to, to set out to build. He knows immediately whether it's the latest revision, 
and, and we've realized uh, after we implemented that that we could easily add the date of the, of the export, the date of the design. We could add the designer's name to the data and possibly the guy's mobile phone number if there are any problems. Finally, collaboration. Collaboration, again, is an inherent to a BIM system. Uh, the ability to share data across different design teams uh, with different disciplines is, is fundamental. There are software vendors out there who'd have you believe that the answer to collaboration is to keep the, indesi the entire design within their suite of programs. This is a, a great marketing ploy, but I, I'd reject that. It, basically, it stifles competition and, and therefore stifles innovation. And without, to, uh, without the need to innovate, our entire industry is, is the poorer. So that's my definition of a, of a BIM system. If you've been involved with GIS, you'll be looking at the definition and saying, well, you know, we've been doing that for years. And of course you have, almost. In many situations, there hasn't been a 3D viewer. Uh, it may not have been designed using solids. Um, but in the case of the GIS system, yes, it has, it has had attributes. Um, the most important thing, of course, that's missing is you haven't had a cool name for the whole process. In a similar way, we could take a look at 12D model and say, hey, 12D model provides a BIM solution. Uh, 12D model is able to do all of those things, um, makes it a BIM product. The other thing to realize is that there are whole sectors of the structural and building services industry that have spent years collaborating using paper drawing. In some ways, BIM is the industries, those, those industries catching up with what the spatial and civil sectors have been doing for years and years. So, Sharing and collaboration, we're looking at a data exchange format to make that easy. And there are a few options. We could use one of the GIS formats, and that's, that was mooted early in the piece. We could use the ADAC format, which has been developed by the IPWEA, which is a, a, a schema, a format for exchanging data to do with uh, local government authority assets, and would, would work very, very well. But it turns out the best we have come across so far is a format called IFC, Industry Foundation Class. IFC has been developed by BuildSmart. It's an outfit in the UK uh, tasked with uh, pretty much that, with developing a, a specification for a file format for data exchange. The important thing about IFC is, is th there are three, three important things. Firstly, it's non-vendor specific. It's not owned or controlled by, by one of the big software houses. Secondly, it's been mandated for use on BIM projects in the UK by the UK government. So, if you're working in the UK and it's a BIM project, you must be able to produce IFC. And that's, that's motivated all of the larger of all of the, the software providers to be able to, to work with BIM. And that, that's the third item, is that it's, it's supported by pretty much every piece of BIM software that you could think of. And it's certainly the preferred format for sharing data from 12D. I want to move on by showing you an example of BIM in the civil industry from a couple of years ago. Uh, it's the Morton Bay Rail project. The next couple of slides I'm going to show you are from a presentation done by Dan Triloff at the 12D Model User Conference in July 2014. Uh, Dan's with, with ACOM. Um, ACOM used 12D Model for services, uh, civil stormwater design on the Morton Bay Rail project. Navis worked, Navisworks was used as the collaboration tool across all the other disciplines. Uh, and Oricon were working on this a couple of years ago. You can see on this slide, the, the blue line across the center of the screen, there is a stormwater drainage line that's been brought in from 12D using IFC. Uh, and you can see the little red spot there and the little green spot there, their clash detection is happening. We can see the, the, uh, the pink and, and light blue conduits that are running up through here. Again, they're modeled inside 12D. The vertical piles have been modeled inside 12D as, as, uh, as pipes with the uh, same X, Y coordinate for the top and bottom, but different Z values to, to allow the modeling of those piles. The next, shot so, uh, the next shot shows a slightly uh, different part of that same project. And this is incorporating information from 12D, the, the cross-drainage culverts, the, uh, the culverts along the route of the, of the rail line, uh, along with information from other disciplines to enable uh, clash detection across all of the, uh, the whole project and to, uh, to give an overview of how the whole thing fits together. Now, this was done over, over two years ago, and, and I think that it added value to the project. I think it was what we got out of the the conference presentation. Now, you know that 12D is traditionally a string-based design tool, and for long linear structures like roads, strings certainly are the way to go. 12D model also makes extensive use of attributes, and attributes can be assigned to pretty much anything inside 12D. Strings, uh, solids, pits, pipes, segments, points, pretty much anything. 
when 12D Model 11 was released, we got a new entity uh, in the program. The, the program is called a trimesh. Uh, anyone else would call it a solid, but in, in 12D it's called a trimesh. This is a, a building that's been brought into 12D from Revit. Uh, the solids that you see there, you're looking at a 12D screenshot. Those are solids that were created inside Revit and brought into 12D again for, for collaboration inside 12D. And we'll be taking a look at this project live in, in, uh, in 12D in just a couple of minutes. As well as adding trimeshes to 12D to enable us to have solids, 12D solutions also enhance the capabilities of snippets for use in road and highway design. Um, most specifically, they added the capability to include solids in the, in the snippet definitions. And for those of you who might not be aware, a, a snippet can be thought of as a, a little tool for creating an intelligent object in, inside 12D. Uh, perhaps a, a tool for creating a component in the road design, perhaps a, a curb and gutter, perhaps a, a highway carriageway. Um, also for, for changes, perhaps a transition between curb types. And you can see here, this is the snippet that's used for creating pavements underneath roads. This particular snippet creates three layers of pavement and uh, you can define their depths, you can define the, the materials that they, they use, uh, that, that they are constructed from. This is what the snippet looks like. This is what the pavement looks like when that snippet is used. This is, a, again, a screenshot that we'll, we'll take a look at live in just a moment. The, the snippets give us, inside 12D, give us intelligent objects that can be viewed in 12D, that can have attributes assigned, and that we can share very easily to other BIM software. And I've got a couple of instances where this, this operation, this has been used on projects in uh, quite recently in New South Wales. Firstly, the Sydney Light Rail. Design kicked off a little over 12 months ago for the Sydney Light Rail. Um, for those of you who might not know, the, the SLR route runs up George Street, which is the main street of Sydney. Uh, it's an ambitious project. George Street's been in place for over 200 years. Uh, it's got 200 years worth of utility services underneath it. It's running right through the middle of the CBD in downtown areas, so those services need to stay intact. We can't switch off, uh, can't switch off power or water to these high-rise buildings. This is an artist impression of what the, the Sydney Light Rail is going to look like when completed. And you can see the, the, the high rise in the background, you can see the heritage building in the foreground. It's literally right up the main street of the city. This is a sketch of the route of the Sydney Light Rail. Um, again, for those of you who, who are geography, uh, aren't familiar with the layout of Sydney, this is the Opera House location here. Circular Quay with the ferries come in, uh, the Harbour Bridge running up here, and the Sydney Light Rail route running southward north-south, down George Street, it actually carries on past Town Hall down to Central Station and down to the southern part of the city. The SLR team that we dealt with was made up from staff from, from GHD, Jacobs and Cardno. And their mission was to model the services, identify clashes and diversions, and uh, as you can expect, there was a lot of potholing, remote sensing and, and, and an extensive use of as-built information on the project. They used 12D model to model the services, and again, they used Navisworks for collaboration. And they brought the data into Navisworks via IFC. Now, as a result, the IFC writer in 12D was hugely improved. Now, the IFC writer got an overhaul between version 10 and version 11. It was rewritten for version 11, which was fantastic. But after the, after the use that the SLR team uh, put it to, uh, we were able to find and iron out pretty much every other little issue that you could think of, every permutation, every, every tweak that you could think of making. It worked pretty well before, uh, but it's getting really great results now. The other project I'd like to talk to you about is a, another fairly significant project. It's um, for a, an outfit called Pacific. It's an upgrade of the Pacific Highway between Walgolga and Ballina in the north of the state. Late last year, the RMS awarded the contract to a joint venture called Pacific Complete, and their mission is to deliver 106, or just over 160 kilometers of new Pacific Highway um, in the northern part uh, to, to connect up with the highway at Ballina. The design partners in Pacific Complete are, are PB, Parsons Brinkerhoff, and Lang O'Rourke. They, they have the contract to deliver the highway. Um, they don't have the contract to design the highway. So they're working on behalf of the RMS. They're acting as the client's agent. And the project has been split into, into four sections, and there are four teams working on the, on the project, on different sections of the project as we speak. Uh, GHD with BGNE, SMEC and Opus, Arcadius, Arcadius and Becker, uh, Arab and Cardno, and um, I think the the uh, work is progressing very very quickly. Now, Lang O'Rourke came to the project 
without much in the way of highway design experience, but with a strong track record in, in digital modeling of industrial plants, chemical processing plants, materials handling and the like. And the word that I've since found in the industry is that, that Lange O'Rourke tends to build everything twice. They've got a reputation for building it first electronically and then building it secondly at a one-to-one -one scale uh, out on the site. So they, they were very keen on the, on the BIM system and they came with some pretty specific requirements. This is part of the project brief that was released last year that uh, consultants were able to bid on to, to, to uh, do work on this, on this project. And uh, it has a pretty clearly, it pretty clearly shows Lang O'Rourke's influence on the brief. It shows what they require in terms of solid modeling for the entities that are going to be produced, the naming that's required for those solids, and uh, another page shows the attributes that are required for the solids. During the bid period, we, uh, EXDS, we met with Pacific Complete on a couple of times, and we gave them samples of IFC data that had been produced from 12D model. The project brief actually stated that an IFC file was to be supplied. One of the deliverable, one of the deliverables was an IFC file. So we were pretty keen that the design teams would be confident they could use 12D to deliver the BIM components on the project. So we worked up a, a project, we worked up a design in one of our sets of training data, and we used uh, snippets, we used trimeshes to produce the design, we assigned attributes to the solids, we exported it to IFC, we opened it up in Celebri and had a look and we forwarded it along to the Pacific Complete guys for them to take a look at and give their comments and, and the response was positive. Now I'd like to show you that design. I'll show you it to you inside 12D. I'll show you how the design works and then we'll take we'll take a look at exporting it and taking a look at it at it in Celebri. Down here I've got a couple of 12D model projects. We'll start off with the highway design. And this highway, as I said, based on a, a set of our, tra our training data on the right hand side of your screen is the design that was completed with snippets and with trimeshes. So we've got solids, we've got the three pavement layers there. We have a, a, a conduit here for services or for subsoil drainage. You can see the batters have been modeled, modeled as solids as well. On the left hand side we did a traditional design where we designed using strings and then created a tin of the design and both come across quite nicely to, to the IFC format. I'll show you how the, how the snippet works. If I go into my uh, design and um, take a look at the edit for the right-hand side, and we'll modify, we'll modify the pavement. Let me just arrange this so you guys can see it. Zoom out and zoom back in again. So we will be changing the pavement thickness for this pavement. You can see in this MTF file, this is this is a set of instructions to 12D about how to how to treat the cross section, how to design the road. We've got a snippet there that places a road curb. We've got a, a changing the cross fall of the road, uh, inserting a new string, inserting a batter. It's an RM, uh, MTF snippet. It creates a batter. Uh, deceleration lane a little further up the up the road. The one I'm looking for here is the the MTF snippet, a tri mesh multi pavement. If I take a look at this, we've got three layers of pavement. The first layer is 100 mil thick. The second layer 300, and the third layer 300 again. If I change that from 300 to 600. We can apply this, and it'll it'll take a moment to run. It's sitting and thinking. Refresh the screen, and you can see that that pavement layer has increased from 300 to 600. So, having done that, we'll uh, we'll leave that. We'll put this aside, and we'll export the uh, the information on this view. We'll take it out to out to Celebri. Very very straightforward process. We'll go file. I nearly forgot. To get the attributes that we need on is is a post process. Um, and we've set up a small chain to assign the attributes. So I'll go into my utilities chains and run a chain which is the apply attributes chain. And all this is doing is taking the name of the entity and applying an attribute equal to the name. And I'll show you those in Celebri. We do the file, uh, the, the output, run it out to an IFC file using the express writer. We'll take everything on the view, and the view that I'm looking for is my OpenGL view. I'm just looking down here at the name of the view. Uh, yes, we'll export the attributes. We'd like to have those. Thank you. The file name, we'll call this one Road Design, without the B, and we'll push Write. It takes a moment to write because there's a fair amount of data there. We're looking at a little over a kilometer of, of, of highway and quite a lot of 3D data. It'll come back to us in a second. There it is there. The IFC file, we can open and take a look at it, but we can open it and we can take a look at the data inside it 
inside Salibri. So Salibri will take a moment to open and then it'll load that IFC file. It's a fairly large file, so we'll be waiting for a, a couple of seconds. Down the bottom here, it's importing the IFC, building the 3D solids in Salibri. And here it is in the view. It's just here someplace. I'll do a, a zoom extents in Salibri and then we'll spin around and take a look at this. Here we go. And you can see here, you can see the, um, the 3D solids that we've created inside 12D have come across to Salibri. Give that a bit more zoom. Uh, if I click on it, it highlights in Salibri and you can see that it's got a code. Now that code came from the, uh, the requirements of the Pacific Complete. You remember the codes on that last slide I showed you. But as well as the codes and as well as the, the information about it here, which is just um, native to the, to the information, uh, we also have attributes. So we've created an attribute called asset name and we've just used the code. We've assigned the same name of the entity as used as the asset name. We've also assigned a discipline attribute and that discipline is RV. So that's, that's working very, very nicely. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have the information that came across from the traditional design technique, which was our, our strings and, um, and tin. And once again, we can click on these and we can find out that the information is a, it's a triangulation uh, it's got a color, it's architectural. No attributes assigned to this triangulation, as you can see. Uh, this is the older way of, of producing the information. So that's, that's again, it's a, it's a very quick and simple process. And you may have seen inside 12D that we can chain that up as well. If I take a look at my utilities chains and, uh, and look at what I can run. We've got a master chain that, that runs all these and the, um, the export the design chain is, uh, is called up from the master if we need to. So we can streamline the export of the information to IFC quite, quite easily. Now, the second project I'd like to take a look at is, again, it's a 12D model project, and it's the stormwater drainage design for that very same, that very same highway. Back to, the, back to the design here, you see we have a depressed median in the, in the center of the road. This is the stormwater drainage for that, that road, for the depressed median. It's, it's exiting out to the right-hand side of the road here, and there's a headwall pr produced. And we've also got some cross drainage happening, happening just, just now. The export to IFC is, is identical, and I'll, I'll do that in just a moment. But I wanted to point out here that we have a, a headwall, and again, this has been produced inside 12D. We've had a, a routine written that will produce the headwall for us based on the size of the pipes and the number of pipes, and will produce a standard headwall. So that will export. That's that's one solid that will export via IFC to Salibri and it'll appear in Salibri as, as a solid. So I'll go through the same steps here. Uh, we'll go File, Data Output, down to IFC, use the IFC Express Writer, take all the data that's on a view and the view is my 3D view. I'm looking down here to see the 3D view. Uh, yes, we'll export attributes, we'll export it to an IFC called Drainage and push the right button. This takes just a second. This is a lot smaller than that highway design. And once again, we can open it inside Salibri. Longest part of this presentation is waiting for Salibri to open. There it comes. Once again, loading the data in. Here's the view inside 3D. I'll zoom extents again. And it'll spin around so we can see the, the drainage line. So you can see it's a pretty much a, a clean representation of what was, what was modeled inside 12D model. I'm looking for this, I'm looking for this um, headwall. Here it is. This is the headwall we looked at inside 12D. Modeled beautifully inside Salibri. If I click on it, we can find out information about the headwall. We can see its name. And again, that name comes from the, the definition that, that Pacific Complete gave to us. And we can see the attributes. This has had uh, the name is also stored as an attribute on the line, and that's great for the head wall, which was created after the after the stormwater drainage line. If I click on the drainage line, you'll see that that line, and in fact the whole network, has been analysed in 12D. We've done a hydrological and hydraulic analysis. We've figured out the hydraulic grey line. We figured out that the network is large enough to take the storm flows. And all of the attributes that were produced as part of that analysis have been transferred across via IFC into our BIM system. So we're not throwing any information away. You can find the partial intensities, the, uh, the CIAs, the, the rainfall information that was used to model the thing. 
uh, you can find the critical velocity, the diameter of the pipe, it's a 750 there, stored as an attribute. Interestingly, one of the requests we had from the Sydney Light Rail providers was to, could we cull out these attributes? We, we, we need to analyze it inside 12D, we need to make sure that the network's big enough, but we don't necessarily need all this information in our BIM system. So the answer was yes, we could, we could provide a tool that, that removed some of these attributes and made the file just a little less, little less cumbersome, a little less clunky. Uh, back to here, we can see the different parts. So the, the um, as you see, the export to IFC works very well. It's very, very easy to do. The product inside the, the BIM software is, a, is an exact replica of what you see inside 12D, complete with attributes and all of its, all of its data. The last project that I want to show you is the importation of information from Revit. This is the, uh, the data, this is the project that I took a screenshot from and showed you earlier in the PowerPoint. It's, uh, as you can see, it's a, a building, number of buildings here. It's modeled on the ground. We take to spin around this and spin this around and you can see how much care the, uh, the architect has taken with the ground. I'll full scale that. Um, here's, the, here's the building, we can click on this building we can, we can turn different layers on or off. We can zoom in here. We can see the detail of the building and you can see they've gone to some, quite some trouble. Uh, nice little double bed there, complete with bedside tables. Bit of a storage, bit of a wardrobe. We can't quite see what's in the wardrobe, the other beds. All of these solids have been modeled inside, have been brought in from Revit and have been reproduced inside 12D. Now, if I take a look at this in the plan view, I can zoom in here and using my string inquire, I can pick on one of these entities and it, it tells you that it's the an architect architectural design furniture. Uh, it's in a model called design furniture stainless steel flat part. It's a 3D tri-mesh, it's black in color, number of vertices, edges and so on. This triangulation, this tri-mesh is available inside 12D, it's usable inside 12D. The different models are available to be turned on and turned off. We turn off the um, exterior walls, we can see a bit more of the beds and so on. We can, uh, we can investigate, see what's happening down below. Staircase and so on, as, as was modeled inside Revit. So we've got a, a fairly clean interface between Revit and 12D as well. All, very, all works very well. Um, most of the problems have been ironed out and uh, we've got a, a, very successful, it's a very successful solution. I'm gonna come back to the PowerPoint for a moment uh, and hand back to Lisa. I'll push the button and we have the next slide, which is thank you and, and type your questions here. And I'll pass back to Lisa now. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Tony. Now, I think we've got time for a couple of questions that have come through. Greg from Adelaide would like to know, uh, how much extra work and extra cost do you think it will add to our projects to add BIM? Yeah, Greg, you, you, you've nailed it there. That's the, um, that is the $64 million question, isn't it? That's just about impossible for me to, for me to say. Um, I've got to say that at the outset, in the, the early days, which are where we are now, it's definitely going to have a cost impost. It's don't, definitely going to cost you time. It's going to cost you money to implement these systems. I think fundamental to making it cost effective is to know that you're doing it at the start and to have a system in place at the start with the expectation of having to export solids and have attributes on the solids and export into a BIM environment. Uh, I think the, the surest way to buy into a disaster is to, to complete the design and then go, right, let's do the BIM stuff. You're gonna spend as much time again producing the BIM components as you did producing the design. So planning from the outset, getting the workflows in place to start with um, is the key to, to doing, it, doing it effectively. I couldn't give you a feel for how much more time it's gonna cost you uh, or, or money it's gonna cost you. It's a very, 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 very subjective, very, very difficult thing to qualify. Uh, I will qualify, though, qualify that comment by saying that I'm, I'm convinced that the second project that you do using a BIM system will be a whole lot easier and a whole lot cheaper than the first project, and that in every way, 12D Solutions and, and EXDS are, are here to assist with, with the uh, production of your, your BIM, uh, the, the BIM requirements for your project. Okay, I hope, hope that's useful too. I not, not, didn't really answer your question, but, but, but I hope that's useful nevertheless. Thanks, Tony. Um, Anne from Perth has asked, are the solids inside 12D model extrusions or are they true solids? 
And again, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. Anyone who's used the visualization capability of 12D knows that, that uh, extrusions are used. We use them for guardrail, we use them uh, for, for other bits and pieces like that, for roadside furniture, signs, um, and, and that the extrusions aren't quite solids. So they're, they're a shape that's extruded along a string. So the, the answer is, when they come across to the BIM system, they come across as solids. There's a routine that converts them from extrusions into solids prior to exporting them. So that you, you do get, you do get for all of the entities that you have designed. Uh, for some things inside 12E, there's a little bit of post-processing first. You've got to convert them from extrusions into, into tri-meshes. Again, that's chainable. You don't have to do it by hand, click, click, click every single time. You, you do need to know that it's necessary to do it. And uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's the figuring out the workflow, figuring out the process that you'll use to produce your BIM output uh, and knowing that you need to do things, these things ahead of time uh, is, the, is the key to a successful output. But, but thanks for the question. That's, that's, that's relevant as well. Thank you. I think that's all we've got time for in the live Q&A today. I'm sorry to those whose questions we haven't been able to get to in this session, but we'll certainly be answering you individually. The recording of this webinar will be available in coming days on our website and our YouTube channel. Our next two industry solutions webinars will be 12D model data management on the 20th of April and industry accepted method for assessing risk of aquaplaning on the 4th of May. We're also launching our new training webinar series on the 6th of April with a great presentation on design speed tables. We'll update our website with many more topics in coming weeks and also keep you posted through email and social media. If you need to contact us in the meantime, our details are on the screen now. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you at future webinars.